Today, I'm very excited to welcome Jason Roberts, coming from um, San Francisco. Um, and I think you came to Europe, I think, five or six days ago. Um, and he will present his award-winning, very, very fantastic and also famous indie game, Goro Goa. And um, for all of those who already played the game, it has those fantastic, really, really interesting game mechanics and game, game design aspects. And I think that's um, that's mainly to talk about. And I saw parts of this talk already, and it was so fascinating that I really wanted to invite Jason here and share all of those insights with you guys. So let's give a very warm welcome applause to Jason to come all the way from San Francisco to Graz to share those insights with you. Hello. Hi, everybody. Um, welcome to the talk. Uh, yeah, it's, it's an honor to be able to come all this way and, um, and talk about uh, my little game. Uh, this talk is mostly a sort of design history of the game. I really personally enjoy hearing other designers just talk in detail about their, their thought process, and I hope you feel the same way. Um, um, I'm Jason Roberts. Uh, I don't have much of a history as a game designer uh, before this one game. It's the first game I ever made. Uh, prior to that, I was a software engineer. I quit my job in 2012 um, and basically was working on the game for five plus years. Um, and that's I think that's partly because I didn't listen to the conventional advice, which is to, if you're making games, to start small. Um, and you know, make your first few games very simple and small in scope. Um, and because I didn't do that, I wound up having to learn those same design lessons over the course of making one big game, and it took you know more than five years. So my this process is not a counterexample to the idea that you should you should start small. It's what's it's an example of what happens if if you don't. Uh, just in case. Anybody here is not familiar with the game at all. This is a very short video that gives you a little bit of a taste of how the gameplay works, just so you won't be totally lost. It's a game made up of panels. You can interact with the panels, um, move them around, split them apart. Uh, some panels have holes in them. You can stack them on top of other panels. That causes the world to change. And finally, panels can connect horizontally or vertically. That's most of what you need to know to follow this particular talk. I like to, in talking about where the game comes from, I try, like to go all the way back kind of to the beginning of my life and just go through some of the inspirations that I feel like affected the uh, visual style, uh, the themes, and the, and the gameplay. Starting with um, a 19th century Scottish painter named David Roberts, who traveled through uh, the Middle East and Egypt and painted a lot of these old ruins kind of half buried in sand. And as a child, these faraway places seem really full of ancient and otherworldly sec secrets. And I found that idea very, very romantic, as did the fans of David Roberts' work. So that sort of influenced the themes I was interested in. And uh, visually, his visual style is uh, very exact in one sense, but also kind of soft and dreamy. And that I think that influenced um, my visual style. Sometime in grade school, um, I was exposed to a book called The Mysteries of Harris Burdick by Chris Van Allsburg. And each page in the story is supposedly one illustration. Each page in the book is supposedly one illustration from a different, uh, different story. But the stories themselves have been lost. That's the idea behind the book. And the reader is encouraged to look at each picture and fill in the rest of the story. And this was an important uh, demonstration to my, my young mind um, how how uh, powerful and evocative like a single image, a single loose image could be and the way one image can like kind of like a, a hologram can suggest an entire world that 
extends uh, extends beyond the frame. The first uh, video game that was very influential on me was a very old game from 1987 called Fool's Errand. It was full of these word and picture puzzles, and they all sort of came together in the end to form this meta puzzle where you rearrange tiles on a grid to form, to connect up a path and form like a larger image. Um, I like the sort of shadowy, mysterious art style and all the uh, symbolism associated with the tarot, which is which the game was was based on. And I think maybe the single biggest influence on me as a as a designer was this puzzle book called Maze uh, that's by Christopher Manson. And each page in the book is a room in some sort of mysterious maze. It's like a giant house that somehow exists outside of space and time. Um, and where it is, or you know, uh, uh, you know, whether it's uh, the afterlife or something like that is is completely unclear. I only partially solved. The, the book, I found the path through the maze, but there's a deeper mystery that I never unlocked. And over time, I decided I didn't want to because the feeling of mystery that the game created was uh, more important to me than solving a puzzle. Also, the, the work of the Miller brothers, uh, the Cyan Worlds, um, and these sort of classic adventure games, uh, Cosmic Osmo, Mist, Riven, um, they had an approach to creating these imaginary worlds that uh, it felt like they felt like real places, but they also felt like gathering of shapes from the uh, unconscious uh, shapes and, and symbols. And they also really liked the kind of gentle pacing in which you could you could explore these worlds. Gustave Doré was another 19th century traveler and illustrator. Uh, kind of a midpoint between David Roberts and um, Christopher Manson. Uh, I adore these illustrations, especially these are from the Alhambra in Spain. And uh, I was very influenced by this intricate kind of recursive uh, geometry of this of this architecture. And, um, you know, the, the Islamic decorations here, like they literally blur the line between text and, and ornament so that fed into this, my desire to believe that all architecture is speaking in uh, kind of like secret messages. Also very important, comic artist Chris Ware, who was amazing for many reasons, but I was really inspired and fascinated by this ultra dense, highly, very uh, schematic compositions of, of story panels. And they went way beyond just chronological uh, panel orderings and added, uh, mixed them up with maps and genealogy charts and multi-dimensional graphs. And this made me start thinking about the power of multi-panel compositions beyond, you know, ordinary comics. Maybe less surprising um, is Eco, which, uh, you know, the, the whole world this of kind of sand-colored ruins uh, whose origin is never fully explained. Uh, it feels a lot like a David Roberts painting that we, we saw at the beginning. And kind of like the Cyan games, I like the, it has a very quiet and unhurried approach to creating a sense of mystery and, and awe. Uh, last on this list, which is by no means comprehensive, uh, is a book by Sean Tan called The Arrival at it's an allegory about the experience of refugees, and we ex and the and how strange it is for them to arrive in a in a in a different country that they don't understand, and we experience that strangeness with them uh, because everything in the city, from the smallest objects to the largest building, uh, is sort of imaginatively alien and and peculiar. Um, and there are lots of amazing illustrations in the book, but I chose this one because uh, it most closely resembles the opening of the game. So let me now talk about the design history of the game itself and sort of step-by-step step where the mechanic came from. A year or two before I started work on Gorogoa, I was working on a comic, trying to make a graphic novel style comic. 
But I was having trouble with the story and that process kind of stalled. But I also realized that I was more interested in composing these panels uh, as a two-dimensional arrangement than I really was in telling a sequential story with the panels. Um, and there was something about this, you know, seeing all these little windows on screen at once, This it was kind of like a quilt or a mosaic of little compartments um, that I found somehow fascinating. So I wanted to do something in this medium that wasn't exactly a comic. Um, and I also wanted it to be interactive. I was interested in making a game. One of the earliest ideas was to try and turn it into a card game, I guess because comic panels uh, loose by themselves look a little bit like cards. And also, if you're making a game this, you know, the structure of a card game is kind of comforting because it has built-in rules, it has built-in in motivations, and that lends some structure to the design process. In one of my all-time favorite games, which was The Fool's Errand, had this tarot-based card game inside it that whose rules were kind of mysterious. And, uh, and if you're wondering how that card game worked, um, I have I have no idea because I never actually made it. I just created this mock-up for for fun. Um, the fact is I don't know much about card games, and especially back when I started the game, I wasn't that interested in the rules, so I don't know how to make them fun or challenging or deep. Um, and besides, I wasn't I was I think pursuing that mechanic for the wrong reason. What I really want to do is just motive give people a reason to interact and dive into these uh, panels. And I wanted a way for them to relate to each other. Um, and I was using a card mechanic that I wasn't actually that interested in to, to motivate that. And it's never a good idea to add a core mechanic to your game that you're not that interested in. But they, you know, the comic panels also sort of reminded me of Dominoes, which is at least a simpler game. Um, and so maybe by simplifying the rule set, I could uh, shift the weight of the design back towards interacting with the panels and away from complicated top-level game mechanics. And I had this idea that you would sort of, within each world, within each window, you'd kind of explore the world and maybe find patterns of dots hidden uh, inside the worlds themselves, and then that would allow you to play to tiles next to each other. Um, but that, I mean, this isn't a great mock-up, but again, like the, just matching up dots doesn't feel very meaningful. It's, it's simpler, but it doesn't lead anywhere thematically or, or narratively. But uh, when you think about it, uh, dominoes are also sort of like a jigsaw puzzle in that they're made up, they're both made up of tiles that connect according to a rule. Um, in one case, the rule is matching the number of dots. In the other case, the rule is forming a continuous picture. And, you know, I've always liked this kind of puzzle where you, this jigsaw-like thing where you rearrange squares to form a larger image. I've always found that kind of puzzle maybe more compelling than I should. There's just something delightful about it for me. And uh, I think maybe having come, you know, through this series of steps, the game that Gorgo ended up being, I mean, it feels almost inevitable. At least to me. Um, and of course, uh, you know, I haven't mentioned it, but Gorgo also involves stacking tiles, which is a little bit different from a jigsaw puzzle, but I think of it as the same concept, just in uh, an additional dimension. But uh, even though the card game version of Gorogoa never happened, uh, playing cards did have one other association in my mind, and that's with a card trick. Uh, one of the underlying themes behind the whole development of the game um, and behind this talk is that I wanted the game to feel magical, like an impossible illusion. Magic is when you achieve something that seems impossible or contradictory or counterintuitive, when you achieve a result, then it's hard to see the path you took to that result. You know, the path is hidden. 
And, you know, in its own little ways, I hope Gorgoa has some of that feeling. All right, let's get into more detail about the game itself, um, starting with how you interact with the game at the top level, which is moving tiles on this grid. Uh, so I compared the game to a jigsaw puzzle, because that's part of where the inspiration comes from. But of course, jigsaw puzzles usually have lots of pieces. That's what makes them interesting. That's the only thing that really makes them challenging. A jigsaw puzzle with only four pieces isn't interesting at all. And when you think about it that way, it doesn't seem like a good idea to uh, limit ourselves this way. Uh, of course, Gorgo is not quite this simple. It's because each jigsaw puzzle is more like a video screen you can interact with. And you can stack pieces, as I said. But still, some people who played very early builds of the game had exactly that reaction. They said, I don't get it. There's only four moves. You know, it's always going to be trivial. So why just this tiny two by two grid? Uh, why not, for example, a three by three grid? That's a more interesting and bigger problem space. Um, and you can imagine puzzles that involve lining up three tiles in a row that are possible in this uh, larger grid. But there's a clear trade-off, which is that the larger the grid is in terms of the number of cells, the smaller each tile is. So you can do less with each tile. First, because you know the tile is just visually smaller, you can't read as much detail, so that forces the scenes to be less detailed. And also, uh, which I discovered the hard way, there's a limit to how much people can keep in their mind um, connecting all these separate spaces and remembering the states, the possible set of states for each space. So the more tiles people have to keep track of, the less state per tile they can remember. In a sense, the overall richness that can be put into the game uh, in terms of visual detail, in terms of the complexity of each scene is a constant. It's just a question of whether it's divided into four panels or divided into nine panels. And divided by nine, it's just, it's spread more thinly. You can maybe imagine something that allows you to zoom on parts of this three by three grid uh, to make the tiles larger. But although that resolves the visual problem, it also means that when the player is zoomed in on part of the grid, they have to keep the rest of the grid in their mind. And that just makes the uh, cognitive burden of the game that much uh, greater. I did actually, or we did, implement a kind of uh, zoom mechanism for the mobile version, for the phone version of the game, because this even the two by two grid was too small, but I never, I always thought of that as a compromise. I never loved that as, uh, as a design solution. It was a necessary evil. That's why it's not an option and uh, like the iPad version of the game, the tablet version. Just for completeness, what about a three by two grid? Uh, it allows the tiles to be as large on the screen because most screens are wider than they are tall. Uh, and maybe this offers a nice, sort of a medium level of complexity. But, and I'm not sure why I can rationally state why I'm not, that was appealing to me. I think something about the square shape was important symbolically. I use the square as a, as a image in the game to represent the earthly realm and in a way, the, the kind of prison of everyday existence and the circle represents something beyond that, something uh, heavenly. And I wanted those two shapes to be in kind of visual balance so that you could draw the square around the circle and they would be symmetric. And I wanted horizontal and vertical to be symmetric with each other. So, you know, maybe that's a little bit touchy feely, but that is, that's ultimately why it was, I went with a square layout and was willing to leave these kind of big empty spaces in the margins. 
And, you know, I also like the idea of minimalism, of doing a lot with a little, partly because it's, it's surprising. The format seems simple at first, like there's only four moves, it seems trivial, and that causes people to lower their expectations. They discount from the start the possibility that the concept could be interesting or challenging. And uh, that makes it, again, hopefully feel more magical when it does become complex. Because a magic trick is not just about doing the impossible. It's about exploiting possibilities that the audience is ignoring or has dismissed in advance. Now let's talk for a minute about how you move through the space within each tile. That was very much inspired by first person point and click adventure games like Mist and Riven, as I said. I wanted to use the third dimension and the first person perspective because I think seeing something in the distance that you want to explore and then moving towards it, that's sort of like the, the purest expression of, of exploration. And also because the dimension of depth is the most impossible and that's feeling and that's what I'm going for. That's what allows it to feel magical. The game is styled to look like it's made out of paper um, from everything like the way the sound effects work when you pick up and put down tiles is designed to sound a little like cardboard. Uh, the, the way these look like flat objects that cast shadows like flat objects. When you see a hole in a tile, looks like a hole through a flat piece of cardboard. Or the fact that they fit together like flat jigsaw puzzle pieces. All these tricks make uh, deep 3D space feel like more of a physical contradiction. Even though we're used to seeing 3D scenes uh, on, on flat monitors. Uh, so that's how the player moves through the world. Um, but how do they interact with the world? How do they physically affect it? Uh, the answer is that they don't. In Gorgoa, uh, you can't physically interact with the world inside the tile at all. You can't open doors. You can't push buttons. You can only move your perspective. Uh, that was a design decision I made very early on, uh, and I had many reasons to question it as I was working on the game. It was partially an attempt to be minimal and, and elegant, to kind of keep myself focused as a designer. Because what's interesting about Gorogoa is you know, how it differs from a traditional uh, adventure game. The way pictures connect and stack, that's what's exciting about the idea. So I figured the entire design should be concentrated on that. And that should be the only way to solve puzzles. But consider like a classic adventure game puzzle, which is a combination lock. It's popular because the lock itself is easy to implement. It just has a few small moving parts. And the rest of the puzzle usually involves the player gathering information, uh, which often has no moving parts at all. Also, because the lock has so many permutations, it's unlikely for the player to stumble across the solution accidentally. So it's a way to create you know, clear and relatively satisfying puzzles using uh, a small number of resources. I could have put a combination lock on this door, for example. Um, and that would be a simple way to kind of, to increase the number of puzzles in the game, which would increase the play time. And, you know, that would be a lot more easy, a lot easier than um, designing these, going through all this trouble to design these scenes visually to fit together. And, you know, you might find the combination lock for this door in another tile. I have to maybe search through this graveyard to find a, a date on a headstone or something. And if you think about it, that's another way in which two tiles can connect. Instead of connecting you know, horizontally or vertically or stacking, they're sort of connecting in yet another dimension, a dimension of information. So maybe they're really 
were some genuinely interesting puzzles that could have worked that way. But how do you even implement a combination lock without buttons or dials or levers of, of any kind? Um, I had made this really hard for myself. This is a puzzle from the original Mist. Uh, in this puzzle, you need to set this clock tower to the right time. So it's basically like a combination lock with two dials. And the way you set the time on the clock is really simple. You use these two wheels at the bottom of the screen. The challenging part, of course, is finding the combination. And Gorogoa also has a clock tower puzzle where you have to set the hands of this clock to the right time to progress. Um, but how do you move these clock hands? How can you enter a combination if you can't touch anything? Without getting into a lot of spoilers, the answer is extremely complicated. Um, it took a, it took months to implement, uh, and it involves multiple tiles interacting in multiple ways, simply in order to move the hands uh, on the clock through these elaborately indirect means. It took a huge amount of time to figure out and implement as a designer. In fact, the process of setting the hands on the clock is so complicated that I just provide the solution uh, that uh, the time you're trying to set it to at the very beginning. Because um, if the player had to find the information, find the combination, and enter the combination, that would have just been an overwhelming puzzle. So in a way, this the design wound up being a little bit backwards. But also, you know, hopefully this is pushing me in a more interesting direction to make a kind of puzzle that you typically don't see. The constraints are at least pushing me um, towards new ways of thinking. But there's a more general problem caused by this design restriction. Uh, look at consider this to be a simple puzzle. Um, look at the version on the left. All you're trying to do is hoist this bucket up from the bottom tile to the top tile. If you have the power to interact with the world, it's simple. I put a little crank handle at the top. You can click on the crank handle and the and the bucket goes up. But once I've ruled out the player touching it, uh, anything in the world, all I can do, I mean, I have to do something like what you see on the right, which is to sort of put a counterweight into the system. Because uh, the player can't input physical energy into the world, I have to build kind of this potential energy uh, that is released when two tiles connect. And uh, what that means is that as soon as these two tiles fit together, the system moves. The weight goes down, the bucket goes up. Um, and yes, that has the desired result, but the dynamic makes it much easier, much more likely that the player is going to solve this puzzle by accident, maybe without even uh, having their eye on these tiles as they fit together. So something suddenly happens, they didn't intend for it to happen, and that can be delightful, but it can also be irritating. And the problem of accidental solutions was one that really plagued the design all the way, all the way through. And another issue is that when this transition happens, the weight goes down, the bucket goes up. That's a one-way state transition. There's no easy way to reverse it without adding a lot of other tiles and multiple uh, pulley systems. And in order to have an interesting state space, you need to uh, have actions that are, that are reversible. The player needs to... In order for the puzzle to be interesting, the player has to try something that turns out to be the wrong move and then back out of that solution. Because this is a one-way transition, once it happens, it has to be the right answer. Otherwise, the game is in an unwinnable state. And, uh, you know, I tried, I put a lot of work into implementing versions of this very counterweight puzzle. Um, this one the little glass jar hanging off the on the right hand side is actually a hole you can stack that on top of other tiles to change the weight of the different parts of the system uh, but it just became too too much work too unwieldy too complicated and i ended up just ditching it 
And the simple ability for a player to turn one crank would have solved all those problems. Um, first of all, the tiles, when they connect, the puzzle doesn't automatically solve itself. There's an additional step, which is uh, clicking on the crank. And also the system is sort of naturally reversible. If you can crank the bucket up, you can crank it down. So that generates the kind of state space that you need for interesting puzzle design. And in the end, I did find ways to build systems into the game that were reversible, uh, this, you know, or cyclical in terms of their state space and where one accidental discovery doesn't solve the entire puzzle. Um, it took a lot of extra work, but as I said, it also pushed the design in, in unusual directions. And you know, it, it cost me a lot of effort in this very early puzzle in the game to implement this idea of this, that the bird would take off from a branch and that would knock uh, uh, a fruit loose and the fruit would fall into a bowl, as we'll see. Uh, you know, and it would have been a lot simpler if the player could just reach out, pick the fruit themselves and put it in the bowl. But would that really have been more interesting? Uh, or is it more interesting because the player, you know, precisely because the player uh, has to accomplish their goals using these strange and, and indirect means? I think as a game designer, you need to carefully manage the player's sense of, of entitlement. If you give them a power, even a simple power, like physical interaction with the world, uh, and then you limit that power in any way, it's it's frustrating. Once they see this fruit, they feel like they should be able to pick it because if they can physically interact with other things, then why not this? But if you drastically limit what the player can do uh, at the outset, then they, I th think, will be more, in a sense, more grateful and more delighted by the fact that they're able to achieve things with their limited uh, ability set. And furthermore, um, I think the player's inability to touch things in the world makes the game more interesting in other ways. Because the player doesn't have a body inside a tile, they're not limited by the rules that govern physical bodies. So in Gorogoa, anything you can see in the distance on the horizon across the cityscape, you can travel to it. And that requires no particular physical explanation. Uh, and even more interesting, I think, you can enter a character's thoughts or memories. You can see a design on a plate and you can just, you can dive into it. Uh, and none of these uh, transitions violate the player's physical expectations about their relationship to the world because I haven't established any expectations to violate. And at an even higher narrative level, limiting the player's uh, interaction, that opens the door to a wider range of sort of narrative and, and thematic interpretations for the game. It allows the entire game to feel like it could be a mental process, like the process of someone sifting through fragments of memory. Fragments that can't be changed directly, um, but where you might find new connections between fragments. And uh, that, that feeling is something that ended up resonating very strongly with the story in the game. I played, uh, I put this difficult constraint on myself early on as a designer. That was a huge amount of trouble, but constraints can sometimes be liberating. All right, let's talk about how the visual style of the game developed. I've always liked to draw, and in particular, I like compositions that have a, a lot of visual variety and complexity and, and texture. Uh, and you know, I like scenes where the eye can spend a long time exploring, kind of roaming over every, every little detail. And from the start, the game was kind of an excuse to do a lot of visual design because I love doing visual design. And it was really as much of a visual design project 
uh, early on as it was a game design project. I didn't really choose a visual style for the game. I just built a game around the visual style that, that I wanted to work in. <laughs> I once asked an artist friend of mine if she was interested in making comics and she said no because she doesn't like the idea of spending hours uh, working on a composition that someone will only look at for a few seconds. And maybe that's not entirely fair, but it's the nature of comics that the more a good story kind of sweeps you along, the less time your eye spends uh, in each panel. So that may be a reason why I was drawn to a medium that would require viewers to spend time studying every detail of my visual design, in, you know, in proportion to the amount of time that I spent uh, working on the scenes. And maybe that also led me toward a slower paced um, adventure game type format and a game mechanic that's all about hidden visual connections. I also had the experience, and maybe you felt the same way, of seeing video game concept art and wishing I could play a game that matched that visual style. But in concept art, the, you know, the form of paintings and sketches has more freedom of expression because it doesn't have to move. It doesn't have to be expressed in polygons or, or animated sprites. So this art style is more varied, but it's also more rigid in a way, or at least we've learned to expect it to be rigid. Uh, we learn, I think we learn to assume that pictures that look like this are, are frozen. They, they can't move. And that assumption, once again, creates the potential for a magic trick or something that feels like a magic trick. Because if I can make a scene look at first glance like a single drawing or painting, I think then any, any movement at all will be surprising and exciting. The truth is that almost no scene in the game is a single drawing. Um, the uh, layers that you see uh, on the right-hand side there are just some of the layers that make up the scene on the left. Uh, and basically when the player's viewpoint moves through 3D space, all these different uh, layers are uh, there. They are assigned to points in, in space, parallaxing. That part I think is pretty straightforward. And also separating the scene into layers allows me to separately control each layer. But it means that the when people ask to see like the original art for the game, they're often picturing something like the drawing on the left and those drawings don't exist on paper. Also because of how drawings are colored. So basically I do the drawings in pencil, uh, usually just on ordinary printer paper, scan them in, clean them up, fill the interior. But so I clean the exterior of the drawing, but it's very important that the interior maintain like the smudginess and the paper texture that comes with a pencil drawing. All the coloring is done in Photoshop on the computer, and that's because it has to change after the fact. I need to be able to change coloring and lighting. This shows the pencil layer and the color and shading layer broken out separately. And here you can see where this drawing wound up uh, in its final location in the game and how the lighting was very different from the way it looked initially. And in fact, uh, most drawings in the game are not, when they're scanned, are not complete drawings at all. They're just partial drawings, collections of pieces that are then heavily uh, manipulated in, in Photoshop. And all the original art looks like this. It's kind of uh, scatterings of, of chunks that have to be cut out and, and assembled. Uh, just a quick look at how movement through space in the game is, is handled visually. Again, there's inside the game is a very simple uh, model of 3D space in which each plane in the game is uh, associated to a, a point in space. And the game doesn't even have a real, uh, the first version of the engine didn't even have a real 3D engine inside it. 
it just does the minimal calculations to to make this work. And when you're zooming in from a from a wide shot to a close shot of an object, uh, it's actually it's not just blowing up a drawing. It's actually using two versions of the drawing, uh, one in the wide shot and one in the close up. Like these are two different drawings of the same chair. And the reason it had to work that way is because uh, a pencil drawing can't be scaled or just arbitrarily scaled up like a vector drawing because the pencil lines become fat and blurry or too small and precise. You basically want all the pencil lines in a single scene to have the same weight to, in order to maintain the illusion that it, that it really is a drawing. And when zooming in on something, I just do a, during the visual spatial transition, I'm just crossfading between two drawings. And they don't always match up precisely, but because of the movement, the eye, uh, the eye has a harder time seeing any, uh, any inconsistencies. Now, um, animation was something that took a huge amount of time uh, when I was making the game. I had no background in animation at all, and I was very stubborn about trying to create everything that was visual myself. Uh, and I think that may have been, I don't know, in retrospect, maybe that was the wrong decision. Maybe I should have worked with an animator. But in any case, the approach I decided to take was to Every time I'm doing something that approaches character animation, uh, I would uh, rig and animate uh, the character in 3D, specifically in Blender. And even that took me forever because I had no past uh, animation experience. Here's the uh, original 3D animation of the bird taking off. Then I would render that animation out at about 12 frames per second. and in pencil, rotoscope over each frame so that the final animation, this was my way of getting the final animation to match the visual style of the rest of the pencil drawn scene. This was a very early, very naive uh, production decision. And here's what that looks like in the game. So I spent hours and hours and days and weeks producing page after page of these uh, rotoscoping sheets, all to get what may have been a relatively subtle effect. In fact, this, this process was not applied to all the animations in the game, as I eventually figured out how to run um, 3D animations through the right pre-processing steps to look close enough to the pencil art. But I actually think that I really like the way these animations ended up looking. They're, they have that the wonkiness and kind of penciliness of, of hand-drawn art that I think contributed a lot to the feel of the game. So I, I don't know. In the future, I'm not sure I would do it differently if I had to go back, but I will do it differently next time. I'll hire an animator. So finally, let's look at the visual trick that's at the heart of the game which is uh, making two pictures connect, uh, like a magical jigsaw puzzle. One thing that you need to understand about Gorgoa is that a lot of the puzzles are actually very simple in concept. All the complexity and difficulty is in making them work visually. This, at least to me, this is a simple idea. A bird is sitting on a branch, the bird takes off and knocks a fruit loose from the branch. But actually making all the different foreground and background layers line up across this seam uh, can get very complicated. And just to make a point about my design philosophy, I'll take this imaginary example. Let's say I want to find a way to make these two scenes connect together so that the character can walk from one scene to the other. They look very different, so it's hard to see how they can connect to form a continuous image. But suppose I put a statue like this into the foreground of each image. Now I can kind of use the statue to hide the seam that connects these two seams together. 
So now this connected scene is visually continuous, except there's still something wrong with it. In my opinion, it doesn't look like a single scene at all. It looks like some sort of a bad Photoshop job where two things have been stuck together and you can't quite find where they join. It looks like a cheat. And so I decided that this approach to making things connect was invalid. When you put two puzzle pieces together, they are joining to form a larger continuous composition. And so I decided it's, it's not enough for just the colors and shapes to match across this seam between tiles. The combined image must feel like a whole composition. And it's true, there are some very surreal and weird compositions in the game. Uh, in this one, the top part of the image consists of boxes on a shelf, and the bottom part of the uh, connected image is the exterior of a building at a completely different scale. But I still worked very hard to make this feel coherent as a visual composition, even if it's not always logical. And uh, note that each half of this combination, this composition, is a zoomed in section of a larger scene. So when two tiles connect like this, they have to be in visual harmony with each other, but they also have to be in visual harmony with the larger scenes that they belong to. So those are two constraints that fight against each other, and they force the two scenes, uh, which might take place at different, completely different points in the story, to be visually entangled with each other in all kinds of complicated ways. So here, this is just showing the seam where the two pictures have to connect together. Um, and again, this pictures are at completely different scales. One is a, a nighttime interior, the other is a daytime exterior. And the problem making these scenes fit together is actually a collection of lots of little problems. For example, you can see the uh, a package on the shelf on the left that's bundled up in string and that matches up with uh, some scaffolding on the outside of the building on the right. And it just took a lot of thinking and trial and error to find two shapes that would fit together with each other, but each one would still look natural in its own scene. And adding scaffolding to the top of the building on the right caused me to add more scaffolding to the building so that that scene made uh, more sense as a whole and it was easier to read what was what was going on visually. Uh, but that, and that kept me, that caused me to come up with the reason why this building has scaffolding on it, why it's under repair. And that caused me to change my sense of when in the story's chronology this scene takes place. So that gives you a sense of the kind of ripples that a visual design decision can cause in this game. Like a small visual design change can end up changing where a scene falls in the story. And uh, maybe it's hard to see here, but these two braided ropes on the left connect to these columns on the uh, outside of the building. And there are these yellow ribbons that help as visual clues that the scenes connect. But all of these elements, again, have to feel like they have a natural and logical reason for being in each in each scene so you so that the uh, yellow banner hanging on the outside of this building is there to uh, advertise an exhibit in a museum the yellow strip on the left is is there because this is a box of sacred objects I mean all this justification exists in my head but uh, but it has to exist you know I have to justify these things, everything has to have an organic place within a scene and not look like it exists only to be part of a puzzle. Like nothing in a scene should look like it's obviously designed to connect to something else. And this, this puzzle in the game, um, it's very simple. It just involves a rock falling from tile to tile, but uh, it took months to finish because of, there are so many visual details that I had to work out and that made implementing simple puzzles extremely difficult for me 
But I think the, the difficulty of executing something this way is why it seems improbable and so why it seems magical. And you can imagine a different approach I could have taken visually, which use much more, and, and this is, it could look much nicer than this. This is a simple mock-up. But the idea is that it would use much more regular geometry and repeating patterns and maybe a repeating visual language. Like every time you see a red roof, that means things are going to connect horizontally. And that would make things more visually modular, which makes things, makes it much easier to design scenes that connect. That would allow me to design more puzzles, make the game longer, and maybe I would have a chance to explore the, uh, possibility space of puzzles more more fully. And that's not an inferior game to the one I made. That's a potentially very interesting game. But I think the same modular tools that allow you as a designer to put these levels together visually also allow the player to take the levels apart in their head. Every time you come up with a, a system to connect things, the players will eventually uh, become wise to it, and, and over time they'll begin to see the visual design as a schematic. The surface of a, of a building or a street will disappear, and they'll just kind of like mentally, I think, see the, the blueprint of how things fit together. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. If what you're designing is a puzzle game, then people thinking in that abstract space is, is fine. But for me, it was very important to hide, as I say, all those scenes of how the parts of the level fit together. So you can look at a scene and have no idea what kind of secrets it, it might be hiding uh, or how those secrets were achieved. So in order to create that feeling, I made a game by a very laborious and irregular and, and inefficient process. So it's a game that's achieved through an unlikely method. Um, and an unlikely method is harder to foresee. It's unexpected. It's harder to reconstruct even after you've seen the result. And I think that is what makes it feel like a magic trick. At least I hope so. Thanks for listening. That's all I got. Thank you so much. I think we have time for a few questions. Sure. If you Do got we have them. questions from the audience? Okay. Uh, thank you for your talk. And thank you for the game. I enjoyed it a lot. Uh, one question that might be a little bit indiscreet. I'm not a game designer or nor a game developer. So I might be interested uh, seeing all the amount of effort you put into making uh, the making of the game. Um, it might be indiscreet questions <laughs> if you refuse to answer, but uh, how long are you able to sustain yourself from one game like this? Because I saw that you uh, put a few years of work into it. Yeah, well, so for one thing, I was very fortunate that I had a uh, job in in tech. I was a software engineer, as I said, and I had a comparatively inexpensive rent control department uh, in the Bay Area in California. So I was able to save up enough money to uh, take a risk to work on something for 18 months or two years. Uh, obviously, it took much longer than that. I spent all that money. Then I was able to find other people to help back the game. First, Indie, Pun, Indie Fund and then um, Annapurna. Uh, the one important lesson to take from this is it was a huge financial risk and not uh, a smart one on my part. So I, I offer that as a, as a caution. Even though in the end it turned out well, uh, the game was financially successful, uh, especially because I was just one person. Um, I had a sound designer and a composer and paid some engineers to do the port from Unity uh, to Unity from Java, which is a whole other long story. 
but yeah, it. I think where I wound up uh, financially at the end is maybe about where I would have been if I had continued to work in uh, tech for five years in terms of the amount of level of savings I'd had. So for me, that was <laughs> a success story. And, you know, hopefully it will have a long tail and continue to make money. But if I had been a team of five people, then maybe the game would not have paid for itself. Um, it was not the wisest path to take, and I was fortunate in many ways that it worked out. Um, do we have more questions? Hi, uh, thanks for the talk. Um, you just said it's a long story, but I would like to hear it. Uh, you know, <laughs> I first started developing in Java, uh, yeah, because you're used to it. And yes, I was. Unity. So in, very early on, it was going to be a flash game back when that was a thing, and I had been a Java programmer. So and I wanted to build a an engine or, or a development environment to make the game in. So I built this big giant tool in Java because that's what I was familiar with and that was going to spit out action script or whatever Flash uses. But I thought, okay, well, I'm just going to build an, a game engine into the uh, development tool so that I can run, just play the game in the tool, obviously. So then I had a game engine written in Java and I just, I said, okay, well, I'm just going to use this to release the game. It offered some limited cross-platform uh, portability. You could run on PC or Mac, and that was that was handy. But uh, the and it didn't, like I said, never had a 3D engine inside it. It was just using Java 2D, which is great for up to a point for manipulating bitmaps. But the whole thing was never going to perform well enough uh, or be portable enough to run on other platforms. So. With the help of the publisher, I ended up hiring another uh, developer to do the Unity ports while I was finishing the content for the game. I think. Uh, hi, thanks for the talk. I sadly I missed the first part, so hopefully you didn't answer this before. But are you familiar with Scott McCloud's understanding comics? Yeah, yeah, very much so. Um, I. Maybe I should probably add that to the list of inspirations. I mean, it was more of an inspiration for a thinking about comics and the larger space than it was for for the game. But yeah, that was very important and and influential. I think a lot of I think it was for a lot of game developers. Uh, and the second question: If if someone were to embark on a similar endeavor as Gorogoa, is there any reading you would recommend, or any uh, watching? Sorry? Oh, oh, shit. Okay, sorry. What? I'll just watch it on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> what? I'm sorry. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I would have, like I said, Understanding Comics is, is a great example. Um, like I say, I've, I've listed a few books that uh, I was influenced by design-wise. Yeah, I'm not sure. I, I've watched countless uh, GDC lectures on design. I wish I could call more of them to mind right now. I started without reading a lot of books on design, and I, I think I've gotten most of my wisdom about design from watching, you know, talks like this from other other designers. Just look for, you know, dig through the GDC vault. Is is my advice. Um, do we have more questions from the audience? Hi, uh, I'd like to know how you can develop such a game for five years because um, I'm just a small game designer, a game developer myself. But I, after half a year or so, I just get bored of my own game. And it's also very difficult to find out whether the new ideas you're having and the new things you put into this are really good because all the test people I had for that game are already used. So I, I can't get new feedback from the same persons again. I found it useful to take the game to different shows and that way new people could play it. Uh, 
most, but what happens when you do that is that most of the playtesting happens for the first section of the game because it's harder to drop, you know, people at shows into the middle of the game and have them understand uh, where they are. But so I would just watch people play it a lot at shows. So that was, that's a high quantity of players, maybe low quality as as playtesters. And yeah, I would sort of portion. This is a, another reason to have more connections, I think, within a broader game developer community because you can you are burning players basically as you have them play test versions of the game. So in my mind, I think to some extent, I just portioned people out and said, "Well, I'm going to save them for future revisions of the game." I didn't do a lot of really formal play testing until until the end. Uh, but that was also, and that was something that was aided by the publisher. They just would bring in rooms full of people who didn't even necessarily like the kind of game that this is. And the goal there was just to see where are they getting stuck? Are they understanding how the game is, is communicating? Um, so, I yeah, I, I don't know. I, that was a concern, but I think I think it was just going to shows for the most part that gave me enough fresh insight to you know keep going. Um, so making this game probably was a huge journey. So my question is, would you do it again? Yeah, I would do it again. I mean, I know how it turned out. Like I say, it was not a smart choice, and I thought it was only going to take two years. I mean, I had a I had a great time. I liked I. I found I love especially the visual design. I like working on art, and this was an excuse to do a bunch of that. I find that very soothing. Game design can be stressful. Uh, is much more stressful because game design is just ugly and broken most of the time. Until something clicks and once something's working, you move on to the next thing. So that can be stressful, but um, but the visual art was uh, helped me stay calm. Um, I feel like that wasn't your question. What was your question? Oh yeah. So so that meant most of the time was enjoyable. Uh, so I I really liked working on it as a project. I liked going to events and shows. I met lots of great people. Got to travel the world even a little bit, even before the game was released. Um, I left my previous career because I didn't love it and wanted to do something creative. There's no question I would I would do it again. Uh, would I have done it even if I knew the game was going to fail? Is it? Different interesting question. That's that's harder, but but yeah, maybe even then. Because it was so rewarding. Um Um you say it uh it's inspired by comics, but the game is completely devoid of any text. Did you ever consider uh text and speech bubbles and that or was it from the get go? Uh, no, I mean, one of the things that I found frustrating trying to write my own comic was that, you know, my words kept getting, that I was writing kept getting in the way of images. Uh, and I was also, I had been trying to write things before I started the game and I got disillusioned with writing in language and had this idea early on that it was somehow more pure to tell a story just visually. And I was very, I was comfortable with, I wanted the game to feel mysterious, so I was comfortable with it being open to a little bit harder to read narratively and open to more interpretations, and taking out text helps with that, and it makes people focus on visual imagery, makes it feel more mysterious, and makes it easier to um, localize, you know, release overseas. And the game... <laughs> Before I had any money to localize the game myself, I released it on the internet and it became very big in China, for example. 
uh, which was possible, I think, partly because it didn't involve any text. Um, I am wondering, like, you released a free version of a game before, and that it, it was super hyped. I mean, what, what did you learn about that? Would you do that again? again? Is this something you could recommend to others? That, that's a hard one. I, I had talked to my publisher about doing the same thing in the future. They were they're very reluctant about putting things out. It can, you know, it can certainly it can seem like an implied promise. If people latch onto something that's in that version of the game and then you change it later, they can become upset. Depending on the type of game you're making, you might be worried that someone is going to take your idea and release a game with the same concept years before you managed to finish yours. But I mean, I wasn't worried about that in this case because the specific way the game works in terms of making designing pictures to fit together was so hard to execute that it wouldn't, it never would have paid off for anyone to try and clone it. Um, and there's a lot of game developers don't necessarily like to release demos after a game is on the market because demos don't necessarily increase are not shown to increase the number of sales. But if you release something playable well before the game comes out, it kind of works like a playable trailer. And in particularly in the case of a game like mine that I think is very difficult to describe, it's very difficult to pitch. You can just let people actually play it and that's that allows them to actually get what it is in a way that a trailer wouldn't. So I think that was very useful for the success of the game and for kind of snowball, slowly building buzz over a period of years. Uh, it, it might not be the right choice for different kinds of games, but I think it was, it felt like the right choice for me and I will consider doing it again. You just mentioned about a second game. Is there anything <laughs> you can or want to share? I, I'm interested in exploring the same sp space of, you know, well, I guess multi-panel storytelling, but in a different way, using a different mechanic. Uh, and in a way that where the visuals and the game design are not as tightly coupled so that I can work with different artists if I have to, or have different artists design different parts of the game. Uh, but yeah, again, it's like the next game is like this one in that it's hard to pitch, it's hard to describe. And I have tried describing it to my publisher and they just look at me uh, blankly because it's you need to see it in action. Yeah, I, I like things that are very visual and hard to put into words and have to be shown. That's what's interesting about them, about, the, uh, about them as design problems. Do we have more questions from the audience? Um, maybe as a closing, you could, are there any recommendations you would give young indie developers? Yeah, well, I, I, again, I caution people not to take the road I do, which is just like, you know, quit your day job and spend all your money. It is a good idea to start small. I think with smaller projects, I think I ended up learning a lot of the same lessons by just iterating on one big project, but I think I, I think I learned them more slowly because there are some lessons you can only learn from a project after it's done and you kind of let go of it and you can give up all the protective illusions that you have in your brain that allow you to keep, keep going. Uh, I think what worked for me was thinking about the kind of game that I could make and was interested in making that no one else was was going to make. Um, and I, I deliberately went into a corner of the design space that was that was difficult to navigate. Like I say, the the combination of the visual style and the way the mechanic works, things connect together, meant that it was hard for me to design in that space. But that also meant that it was hard for anyone else. Else meant I sort of had that space to myself. If you, as a designer, have, if you have multiple skills, visual art and design or, you know, music and design, whatever it is, if you can find a way to, if you find an idea that deeply, uh, 
entangles those two skills that you have. You know, because you take advantage of the fact that you know that you can communicate with yourself, uh, you know, in two roles much more richly than you than two people could communicate with each other. That's that's another way to make your to make your work something that only you can do. Thank you so much. All right. Um, a big round of applause for Jason. Thank you.